uh, now I am. I, I, I will take questions. <laughs> Anyone should have one. I haven't. I I know that I of course know it's out there. It's one of those great old movies. Um, sorry. Yeah, but uh, no, I haven't seen it yet. There's, there's a lot, you know, when, when you start delving into um, all of the sources for this stuff, it's just sort of a never-ending task of, of looking things up and watching things. And there was, um, there was a period at the beginning of working on this book where I was not yet a good writer, and I was too worried about outside influences. And that if I sort of took in too many other people's interpretations, I was going to lose the feel of my own, whatever that might be. And of course, that changed over the years. Um, but it sort of turned into this superstitious thing where there's a whole number. Now that this is in print and I can't change it, um, I'm going to go back and look at all those old movies and, and read those books and uh, sort of re-educate myself. Uh, well, that's a good segue. I've got a coworker who he read the publisher's blurb for the book, uh -huh. and what he said to me is, he said, "Huh? Well, I've already read American Gods, I've already read Cavalier and Clay, and I've already read the Satanic Verses. Why should I read this too?" Now, to be fair, he hasn't read the book, so who is he to comment on it? But it was very astute of him to pick up on those influences yes. without ever even having actually read a page of the book. So. Maybe it's a fair question. How do you make sure that what you write is not redundant with your inspirations? Um, I think the answer to that is carefully. Um, the, and, and what's funny is in the first two, like, he pegged my first two influences. Yeah, very, I noticed that too. Yeah. Um, for, I mean, Neil Gaiman uh, wrote American Gods, uh, which is a great book about immigrants bringing their own gods to America. And um, uh, Michael Chabon's uh, Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay was pretty much the book that, when I read it, um, got me starting to write again. Uh, it was that book has a special place in my heart because it marked a turning point in my life. Um, and I think, why? Well, if you like those two, maybe you like this one. <laughs> <laughs> you know. nice. uh, but uh, other than that, I don't know. Tell them to read the first couple chapters. Maybe you'll find it redundant, maybe he won't. Maybe it's No? <laughs> yeah? Did you uh, start researching the golem and the jenny, or did you do research and find the golem and the jenny stories that inspired you? It really was, it's a really good question, and honestly, they each fed the other. It became a chicken and egg sort of thing. Um, because I had sort of my ideas of what sort of received wisdom from stories I grew up with and stories that we, you know, remember Thousand One Nights and Aladdin, whatever that we get in Western culture. Um, and that was sort of what I had when I started. And then, and so I would, you know, I wrote with that, you know, using that as, as, you know, my basis, and then I sort of got to the end of my knowledge and was like, okay, now I got to start researching. And I started researching, and that research fed back into the characters, and I would write some more, and then I'd research some more, and then write some more. And it really was sort of like climbing a mountain, and every once in a while you got to tie on a new rope. So I would like get to the end of the rope, and then put the research would put another one on. And I had probably one of the most torturous writing processes you could possibly have with this book, where I would start at the beginning, get about this far out, and go, oh, hmm, no, got to go back. And I'd start at the beginning, and then get over here. Uh, no, back started. And I literally did not write the end of the book until seven years after I'd started the beginning. And I had no one draft that was whole until I hit send and sent it off to the publisher. So that's sort of how it all sort of fed back into each other. Yeah. Oh, hi. Hey. Um, when I reviewed this book, I wrote that it left me wanting to slap the next person that sat down and wrote about a vampire. <laughs> and, and that is one of my favorite lines from a review yet. Well, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. But um, I've seen several pop culture genies uh, over the years. 
but very few golems. And I think that they are so ripe for this kind of story. I mean, it was such an interesting approach you took. So I wanted to ask you, you know, sort of what got you there? And also, I don't think I've ever heard of a female golem before. I mean, is there anyone in any other anything that you've encountered? Yes, actually. Um, there's a woman uh, named uh, Naomi Kritzer, who's a fantasy writer and actually happens to be someone I went to college with as well. And she, I want to say it was back in 2000 or around 2000, wrote a short story called The Golem that is set in Prague in 1938, I think. Mm -hmm. And the, um, uh, the story is that a lesbian couple builds a female golem to protect them from the Nazis. And uh, it was collected in the year's best fantasy that year. Um, and it's since been reprinted, um, well, in her own collection, which you can get. Um, I, I think it's um, an ebook only. Um, but it's a really, really good short story. And that was my first female golem. But I'd heard golem tales just, and what's funny is, you know, usually when you say, well, you know, what's your first, the first time you read or heard about a genie or a vampire or a werewolf or whatever, I can usually say, oh, it must have been this movie, this thing, growing up, whatever. I have no idea when the first time I heard a golem story was. I have, like, tried to pin it down. And Sunday I, school. Yeah, Sunday school at the so, synagogue. But I actually have someone who went to Sunday school with me in this room. And I don't think they taught us any good stories. They were too busy doing, like, tr drilling our Hebrew into us so that we wouldn't embarrass ourselves doing our, during our bar and bat mitzvahs. They, it wasn't, that was a very, it's like a very old world thing. And growing up reformed Jewish in, in suburban Chicago, it was, no, you're, you know, we're going to teach you how to, you know, you know, is the Jewish life cycle, and and you know, you are modern. That, that's all. That's all sort of the dusty old fiddle around the roof stuff that we're just gonna. It's over there, and we're not gonna really look at it that much. And I don't think it was my grandparents either, because that wasn't their thing. So I honestly don't know how where my first golem was. So, but they were there. They were just sort of always there. And yeah, I don't know why more people haven't picked up on it. I think maybe it, it just hasn't. I don't know. It, 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 they're they're just sort of silent and like this. They they don't usually the, the golems with actual personalities aren't as as, as prevalent. Yeah, they're more tools. So yeah. Hi, yeah. Hi. <laughs> um, it's kind of weird to ask questions without having read the book, but just based on what you read, I was wondering if you were when you were writing, were you thinking that those first characters were speaking in Yiddish and then these other characters were speaking in Arabic? Like, how did you? work through the language question? That's a really good question. Um, the language question was hard to deal with. Uh, and yes, I did think they were speaking in Yiddish and Arabic. The one thing that has annoyed me to death is um, stories or movies where you have people coming together who should not be able to understand each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, well, it's just the magic of film <laughs> makes it so that, you know, there's one, um, shock a lot. There, that is a movie that is, it's a fantastic movie, but it has always irritated me that, um, oh God, what's her name? I forget, the French actress and Johnny Depp can understand each other. He's like Cajun, and she's from South America, and they're meeting in France, and they just sort of like, hail fellow well met, and they're talking to each other, and they fall in love, and it's like, you two should not be able to understand a word that each other is saying. How is this? So anyway, um, so I, I, my, my workaround was that um, Golems and Jim can, can, uh, in, can understand lang and process languages, sort of. She can the same way that almost like a computer can, and he, because uh, Jin, um, you know, can transform themselves, and, and they, you know, it's the, the way that, that animals understand each other, that, that he can just sort of process any language. And it's, it's I, I hope it isn't too obviously. This is how I did it when I, you know, when you read the book. But uh, that was that was the that was my solution. 